after a couple of years away and it's uh, nice to see everyone's enjoyed our lovely lunch and nice. you've got Prina to thank for that and um, there's nothing nothing quite like the offer of a free lunch after two years of Zoom calls to get everyone to, to turn up nice and promptly um, so yeah it's great great to see so many people here in the room um, this afternoon so just a quick piece of housekeeping before we start I don't believe that we're expecting any fire alarms this afternoon but the fire exit is just in that back corner of the room over there um, and the Wi-Fi password is just up there as well, and on a few pieces of paper around the room, so do, do feel free to, uh, to get on that. Um, yeah, as I said, really, really pleased to be running this session with Western Power Distribution here in, in Cardiff. So my name's Kai Hall, I'm the Project Manager leading our community and local energy work at Region. For any of you that are unfamiliar with what we do, and I know a lot of you already are, um, we're a not-for-profit centre of renewable energy expertise and we're mission-led and that mission is to transform our energy system for a net zero future and make it more decentralised, decarbonised and democratised. And that, that third um, D, if you like, the, the democratisation of our energy system is why for the past 10 years we've run a programme of community energy support, being really keen to encourage the sector across the UK um, to grow working with, with organisations across the country. And for much of that time, we've also been working with Western Power Distribution and supporting them on their community energy programme, doing sessions like this, but also guides, innovation projects um, and different, different bits of in, if, information to really help the, the community energy sector. Um, so I think it's really timely in terms of putting this sort of session on here. I know we heard just the other week about the, the, um, the Welsh Government um, climate Change Committee encouraging the Senate to really increase the urgency of climate action and action towards net zero in Wales. And that's that's one area where the community energy sector can really play a role, partnering with local authorities, with the networks um, and with communities around the around the country to really support that, that net zero agenda. Um, so we've got a really packed agenda today. So I will just run through what we've what we've got on so firstly we'll be hearing from faithful who's wpd's new community energy engineer sort of fresh in post over the past year or so who's supporting groups across the, the south wales southwest and midlands license areas to, to encourage more communities to connect to the network and do generation projects then I'm really looking forward to hearing from emily um, who's part of our and Tawi, and they're a real leading trailblazing community energy charity um, that have been doing doing work in their in their community for almost 20 years, I believe. So really looking forward to Emily's presentation. He's going to take us through an awful response to the climate emergency and that different perspective on how we can get people involved um, and yeah, creative responses for the climate emergency and net zero. Then we're going to have some breakout sessions on topics that you've all told us you want to talk about. So we've got innovation, onshore wind, and partnering with the public sector. And we've got a few sort of key um, local energy experts in each of those to guide, guide you through those, those topics as well. Then we're going to have a quick uh, tea break. So more time for you to sort of network, make the most of being back at an in-person event. And uh, then we've got Paul from Welsh Government Energy Service that's going to talk about their offering for community energy. Before Mark's going to take us through some of the, the key sort of grid challenges, because I know that is an issue for the communities around the country and um, the issues with network capacity marks could just going to talk us through what the future might hold for that what wpd's plans in that area are and a few specific examples of what they've been doing in south wales then we've got time for you to really ask any questions that you want to ask to to both mark to faithful and other members of the wpd team before we sort of wrap up and give you a chance to, to do more network and join us for a little bit longer um, or obviously leave if you if you have to so I'm, I'm sure you saw the slide I had up earlier. This is a piece of work we did um, with Rob's team at, at Community Energy Wales and Wales Government last year on the state of the sector in Wales. So I think that just highlights sort of the, the breadth of community energy activity that we see in Wales. And that's something that we're, I know Rob is really keen to see come forward as well. So slightly uh, outdated information back from when we collected that data a year ago, but I think you can still see that the groups are there and then if we just encourage those, those sorts of projects to come forward, it can really drive net zero around the country, which is why we're so pleased to be working with Western Power Distribution um, on this kind of programme. So yeah, do, do make the most of being here this afternoon. We've got plenty of time for networking and we want to see more of what we've seen over lunchtime. Um, so yeah, do, do you know, we're keen to encourage that sort of collaboration between communities, public sector, Welsh government, and indeed the, um, the electricity networks 
So we can increase, we can increase community energy projects um, throughout South Wales and around the UK as well. Um, so yeah, thank you all. Thank you all for coming along today and I will hand over to Faithful. Afternoon. Uh, so my name is uh, Feth Futan. I work for Western Power Distribution. I may forgot this. Um, I'm a community energy development engineer. Uh, I've been, I suppose, appointed in the role. I was doing other things before that. So hopefully, going forward, you'll use me in this in the space and sphere of community energy. So um, just before I start. Does anyone know what WPD is? What is Western Power Distribution? Do all of us know what Western Power Distribution is? She's not acknowledging, so <laughs> my assumption is not everyone knows. Anyway, by the end of this session, you'll probably know who we are. So I've structured my presentation in such a way that by the end of today, most of you who would know who Western Power Distribution are, what we do, and how we have evolved in the last few years, and uh, how you can work with the grid, and how we can support you as well in community energy. So, Western Power Distribution is the company that operates the, the, the local electricity distribution in South Wales, Southwest England, West Midlands, and East Midlands. We are looking after a population of about 8 million people, and that includes businesses and homes as well. And our system comprises of cables and overhead lines. We've got poles and towers that bring the power to your homes. And then we've got transformers, which step up and step down, uh, depending on, the, on where you are. So for the purpose of, I suppose, the little education, You've got generators that generate the power. Like for example, in this place, you could have said no way power station. So when generators generate the power that has to reach your home, so in between the generator, you've got what we call uh, transmission, which in this particular case is national grid, who are like big, big uh, power lines and substations, then that has to be transformed to something that we can use in our homes. So that's where Western power distribution comes into play. So what do we do as a company? So Western power distribution primary responsibility is to keep the lights on. So to achieve that, obviously if things break down, we've got to fix them. We've got to maintain the equipment that brings the power to your homes. And then we've got, we've got to connect customers uh, by way of either upgrading the network that we already have or by building new ones. And then because the power system has evolved over the years from how it used to be traditionally, because power came from a generator, say in Scotland, and then it reached power flow from Scotland all the way to London predominantly. Now, today what we have is wind farms, We've got solar farms and we've got other forms of generation which we have in our local areas. So because of where they are, the power no longer just flows in one direction. It now flows either direction. So we say power flows by directional. So recognizing the effects of that, it means that we have to manage a power flow system and we've got to be smarter in how we do that. So in order to achieve that then, uh, if you think about, let's say motorway system, if you think about a motorway, motorway can have say two lanes going in one direction. So there are times of the day when either traffic flows nicely or you find suddenly you, you are stuck because there's nowhere to go. <coughs> so a power system works in the same way. So what am I trying to say here? So if you look here, I've got this green line here, which is representing what am I might call a static situation. So that is the physical capacity of, say, an overhead line. 
So you don't want to breach the limit of that. So what I mean is in the evening or during lunchtime when you're cooking, you are most likely going to breach that limit. So what, we, what it means therefore is we must do something on our system to ensure that your demand falls below that green line. Otherwise the system will just collapse. So in short, what I'm saying is a traditional distribution network operator worked in such a way that all they were concerned about was to ensure that you operate below that. All they did was they'll come down the street, remove that cable and put a new one there. But if you think about it, you're not going to do that all the time. So you've got to be smarter. So what you're going to do is you're going to employ systems or mechanisms on the system, which will be able to say, hang on a minute, they're using, they're using too much power there, or they're using too, the demand is gone up there. So they will either bring, they will ask you to reduce your output, which you call demand side response these, these days, or they will do something by, by way of sending a signal so that we stay below that green line. So because the way we operate has now changed, it means that even our definition has also moved slightly. So we are now called distribution system operator because of the fact that we are operating the network in a different way from how it was traditionally designed to operate. So, so as I say, there's a lot of local generation coming on in the form of solar, wind, uh, geothermal and batteries as well. And also these days, people are talking about electric vehicles and heat pumps, which in, in, in yesteryear, it wasn't the case at all. So our network wasn't designed to cope with those huge loads on, this, on, on, the, on the system. And then obviously, day in, day out, we're receiving a lot of applications from, I suppose, from new, new, new developers, even from community energy groups who are seeking to connect to our system. So, and most of the time you find everyone in, in for example, in South Wales has the same problem. They all want to connect to our system, but we'll say to them, hang on a minute, let's wait for what we call a queue to, to clear. So all I'm saying is in, in order to achieve most of those things, the, the general solution is what we call reinforcement, whereby you remove cables or transformers, put new ones there to accommodate the, um, the, the needed demand. But however, it is important at this point to note that whilst we recognize that there is that need, but we are not just going to chuck money at things. Because what will happen is in 10 years time, when we thought we have invested, then comes a problem to say, actually, we don't need to do that. So you spend a million pounds, but in the meantime, you didn't need to spend it. So you have what we call stranded assets. So this diagram here is depicting a situation that we normally, that we have to work to. So here you've got circuit number one, circuit number two, circuit number three. So, Imagine a situation whereby that's, that's one lane, that's another lane, that's, that's another lane, and that's another one. So what you want to do is, before you accept anyone to connect on the system, you want to ensure that, let's get rid of this one and see how the other two will cope. So if the other two are, are struggling, then you hit what you call a limit. Then we will struggle to make you, uh, your connection possible. So in fact, what I'm saying here is, when we are assessing your connection, when you've made the connection with the application to us, we're ensure that if we've lost that one there, the other two should still be able to supply the all of cabbage. So that's what that is showing there. Now, let's talk about new, let's talk about net zero and new technologies. So in 2019, our government, including the Welsh government, they made their commitments to achieve net zero by 2050. So councils and most organizations are working towards that. 
and hence community energy organizations are being encouraged to invest in their local areas. So even us as Western power, we are also committed to ensure that we achieve that. So what is community energy? Community energy, community energy basically means that local communities are taking collective action to address the climate change agenda and also taking ownership of um, the if the taking ownership of um, of, of uh, all forms of energy generation in the local area. So that can be in the form of energy saving advice, fuel poverty action, energy efficiency in schools or buildings. Uh, in certain areas, you might say, actually, instead of us exporting power, why don't we use it locally? So there are all kinds of business models that you can use to achieve that. So that's local supply models. And then, as I say, uh, if you identify that there's a constraint on the system, you might think about reducing your demand. So the whole purpose of that is to reduce carbon and tackle fuel poverty through local ownership of energy assets and you retain the benefits in your local area. So just an overview then. Uh, three weeks ago, I went to Como, that's why that is there, to speak to a group similar to yourself. And uh, so this work that I'm doing, I mostly, come, I, I mostly work with regions who you've seen before, Kai, Prina, and others. Uh, and we've been working with them since 2014 on all aspects of community energy matters. And then obviously, through this program, we have seen that there's a new wave of communities, businesses, local authorities that want to connect to all sorts of new carbon technologies in order to increase efficiency, address fuel poverty, and all the rest of it. So WPD obviously is central to all that, or should be central to all that. So what support do we give then to the community? So we try to give you as much information as possible uh, on how much it will cost you to connect to our system. And we do that through all sorts of media such as websites, surgeries, uh, forums. Uh, only last week or the other week, perhaps, perhaps some of you could have been fortunate to receive a, uh, a what go a, a newsletter from me, uh, which WPD produced with written. So if you didn't receive one, you can just leave your details, I can send it to you. So we look at all kinds of options for supporting the new forms of generation by, by offering flexible green connections. And we also you know, encourage demand side response or demand side flexibility. And as I said, we employ all sorts of smart solutions at the transmission level, as well as at the distribution level in order to maximize the, the system that we already have in place. And then some of you could probably know a concept called open LV. So open LV means that if you if you go to what you call a primary substation, or sometimes even a distribution substation, you can find information on how much is connected at that particular substation in the form of generation, and also what is the demand coming out of that substation. So it is a very good tool for you to use if you wanted to, I suppose, look at what is happening on the system, and especially if you are uh, looking at making connection. So I traveled all the way from Leicester to here, uh, when I suppose one would say, but why do you have to come from Leicester just for this? So the answer to that question is, WPD is looking at employing more community energy engineers so that they'll be local to those areas. So because we've got four license areas, there's going to be four of four people like myself uh, doing that role. So you won't probably see probably this is the last time they've seen me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the help we, 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 we offer is having in-person and online uh, you know, forums for stakeholders. We publish resources, as I say, uh, for all kinds of related organizations. And then you'll be delighted to know that Western Power Distribution 
does have a one million community funds uh, to support communities across the four license areas. So that could be for things like fuel, poverty, energy efficiency. The theme differs each time. So just look out for that. At least it's an annual, it's an annual uh, fund. So look out for that on our website. So the pics are over there. I was in Como. The other one, I've been going to Como quite a lot. So that's one group I went to meet. The fact that I'm standing here means that I won't be able to take pictures because otherwise in my next presentation, you'll probably see yourself there. <laughs> so where are we right now? So we do produce what we call a net zero community strategy. Uh, it's meant to come out every year. So we, our first edition was in, we produced one in February 2022. And then on the 23rd of March, we held an online uh, forum of which about state, community, and local energy stakeholders did attend. And the rating was eight out of 10. So I'm assuming that's a genuine outcome. So uh, that's, that, that went well then. So in order to provide more content and more information to our stakeholders, we are also keen on producing some YouTube videos uh, so that we give you the information that you need. And then I also talked about the community energy newsletter. So that will be a quarterly magazine so, or quarterly newsletter. So you'll be able to get that. And then I think we recognize that we need to speak, we need to speak and in fact meet our community energy groups. So we'll be holding a lot of dissemination events. Uh, throughout the course of the year. The next one is actually in Nottingham next week. Uh, on the 9th, is it? In the 9th, right? Yeah, so you're more than welcome. Then this is just giving you a flavor of what's happening in the United Kingdom as a whole. So by 2021 December, we had about 404 organizations in total community tennis groups. So I think that that number is actually likely to grow. And then from that, you can see that people do realize that the transition to next year is going to affect everyone. And communities particularly are more, you know, they have a huge influence on decarbonizations, on decarbonizations because they are local. And then, um, yeah, so, Within WPD itself, we have about 99 groups in our, 99 community energy groups in the four license areas as of 2021. So there's what we call innovation uh, because we recognize that we've got to work with communities to try and do things differently. That's what innovation is. So there are few funding streams or funding mechanisms available, uh, which WPD uses uh, to support communities. One is called Network Innovation Allowance. So what that means is Western Power Distribution has got a pot of money, which they can use without necessarily asking anyone, although I should be careful with that because that money is actually public money. But We've got, if there's a concept that needs to be proven, we can use that money to, to do some projects. For example, a few years ago, I did a project in Bridgend where we were looking at what we call a hybrid heating system. So what that means is, think about a situation whereby there's a genuine constraint on the distribution or transmission system. Now, Instead of, instead of switching off uh, appliances, you probably switch to you, you probably switch to, to gas. So it is a transition from, from electricity to gas or vice versa. So the project, if you want to check on uh, online, it is called Freedom. So it was done in Britain for about 75 different properties. None of that was commercial, but just household. So we installed new boilers, we installed new um, radiators, and uh, we tried four versions of 
uh, headphones. Then the other one is called network innovation competition. So this one is a more rigorous uh, competition because you, you've got to ask for funding from off them. Of them are our regulator in terms of how we run the system. We are paid by off them uh, for anything that we do. And you'll be delighted to know that on your annual bill, you contribute a hundred pounds per household. And that's that's why we, we have to exist. So from next year, network competition allowance will change to strategic innovation funding. So there is a project called Venice, which we are trying in Como, um, which is at the back of the pandemic that's, that's just gone. So we are trying to look at what is the impact of the pandemic on energy consumption? Can we use smart meter data to, in, a, in a innovative ways to predict customer or consumer vulnerability? And then is it possible to include an energy scheme to engage the fewer poor in net zero? Uh, so that's in common. And then to help us with that, we've got a group called REN who are based in Wedbridge in Como. So as I've said, we'll be looking at what, how does, what are the characteristics for vulnerability? We'll carry out a pandemic persistent assessment, and then we'll, we'll engage with the local community as well. And then all sorts of uh, things will be tried um, as a way of understanding the impact of that. So I'll conclude therefore by saying, community-led distribution generation has got a few challenges because you are competing with large developers. However, because we recognize that we have to run a system, we don't want to say no, we have to be smart in how we do things. So we introduce what we call uh, alternative connections, uh, which I will go in with this part. And then the, the drive to net zero is one of the biggest challenges, obviously. And then WPD is working frantically to see where we can make some capacity available for ourselves, both on the system that is already existing or on new installations. Those are my details. So do wish to get in touch. Thanks for your time. <laughs> I'm sure there will be questions on it. Yeah, way. great. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Faithful. Um, and as he says, do, do get in touch with him. So obviously went across a lot of detail on how WPD and working with communities. There are a lot of different funding streams, a lot of different different pieces of work that they're doing, and a lot of those chats we will be picking up in our in our breakout sessions later, particularly the one on, on innovation. But I mean, from our point of view, we're delighted that WPD have got Faithful in post now, someone dedicated to, to working with community energy. So don't hesitate to get in touch yet. I mean, you made it very clear in that presentation, he's prepared to go down to Cornwall and chat to community energy groups there. So if there's, yeah, if any of you, you guys are running your own sort of community events and want an overview of the electricity network, then do get in touch with Faithful. Or if you've got any other ways that you'd like to work with WPD, then, PD, then Faithful is, is the guy to get in touch with. Um, but for now, I am really excited to welcome Emily up. Um, so Emily is involved with Our Lamentawi, that one of the trailblazing community energy organisations in, in Wales and across the UK. Um, and yeah, she's going to guide us through an artful response to the climate emergency. And we've been from some poetry as well, I believe, uh, Emily. I don't know if there's time Maybe for not. That. Well, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, do, I, do, I, do, I, do I need the microphone? I've got notes to hold. So can you hear me without the microphone? No. OK, I use the microphone. Um, can you put my screen up for that? Yeah. Oh, is it? Oh, it's see. So it's on yeah, there. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, oh, thank you for inviting me here. It's really great to be um, at this energy, community energy forum. Um, so, yeah, my task is to talk a bit about um, our Lama Tower and our arts programme. Um, so we have, uh, over the last 24 years, actually, we started in 1998, um, uh, we've shifted our community engagement focus from one that is, was very, very focused on disseminating and sharing information, facts and figures, you know, the reality of climate change and um, renewable energy. But we've moved and shifted in our approach to one that is where arts is a driving force behind what we do. Um, and, and during this talk, I want to kind of explain why we've done that. Um, an artful response to climate change. <laughs> I decided on that title before I'd actually written it, so it sounds a bit mad. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I have grown over the last 24 years to believe that the arts actually have a massive role to play in climate change or in our transition to a zero carbon um, future, to more sustainable livelihoods and to getting more green energy out there. Um, and when I say community arts, I mean arts that is not necessarily done by professional artists, um, not, not even necessarily done by people who have ever done any art before. Um, but it's uh, community arts is, is a lot of organisations are doing community arts where you'll have a project, you might have a theme that you're inviting people to submit art, art on that theme, or you might have um, a, a sort of collaborative piece of spoken word. Um, but it's the idea is to get people creating something together. So I'm going to be talking about the four main reasons why we have basically shifted to using more and more arts in our Lemon Tower. Um, there's lots of organizing, lots of organizations doing that as well, including Regen. Um, there, there's loads of examples online. If, if, and I'm sure a lot of your organizations have already used arts within your program, but I, I think that community arts complements community energy in a, in a very effective way to, to help deliver this kind of transition. So I'm going to be giving you some examples of our work, but there's loads online to, uh, to get inspiration from. Uh, so my first point um, is about to, sort of comparing science and the arts. The science of climate change is very objective. You know, it needs to be. Um, it's about finding um, universally accepted truths about the state of climate change and uh, carbon emissions, sea level rise, species adaptation. It, there might be a lot of controversy over it, but the idea is that we find some truth and evidence of what's going on out there in reality. Um, the arts, on the other hand, <laughs> is subjective. It's not about finding truths. It's not about, it's not about proving anything. But it's about finding an internal truth. It's about finding an emotional truth. Um, it's about finding a way to represent your perspective or our perspective on the reality of what is out there. And those truths through art can actually speak to us at a really profound, profound, quite a deep level. Uh, it's not all up in the head, it's, it's in the heart as well. Just there. Okay, so um, obviously we need science, we need charts. I know this chart, this is just an example of a chart, you have to read it. Um, it's, it's um, you know, we, we, we need to know what the, what the figures are. Uh, that's underpinning all of our work, isn't it? We, we all need to know that. Um, and a lot of people will look at that and they'll, they'll see it and think, right, we've got to do something about climate change. Um, and they'll be moved to act from this information. But the majority of people don't work like that. The majority of people don't get moved by charts and graphs. Um, people, um, people get moved by all sorts of things, but not necessarily that. It's, it's technical, it's abstract, it's, it's quite stark, it's scary, and it's really quite hard to talk about if you don't have the vocabulary, if you don't have that technical knowledge. 
it's quite hard to, to have a conversation about charts. Um, whereas the arts does give us a different way in. Okay, so um, one of our projects quite early on um, was called Postcards from the Future. And we were inviting people to send us a postcard um, about anything to do with climate change, but from the future, in the light of climate change. What will the future look like um, in however far into the distance? Uh, you can use any um, te art technique you like. So we had hundreds of responses using all sorts of different techniques, so from printmaking, and, um, uh, painting, collage, um, all sorts of things. Um, and everybody had a different perspective on, on it. Everybody, obviously, it's a unique thing to create a postcard and submit it. And that was one thing that is really lovely about the arts. The arts takes us on a journey from something, some broad concept of climate change. It can be quite an alienating concept of climate change and it brings it down to an absolutely personal detail. So I'm just gonna share three of the postcards that we received with you. Um, this one's quite clear. <laughs> it's a representation of, of all the iconic buildings across the world um, being submerged. Beautifully rendered, um, but quite clear what it's saying. Um, I don't know if you can see that, that clearly in the light, actually, but um, it's actually a photograph of, of water, but it's absolutely red along the top, the water that's coming down. So, I mean, you can take, read that in, a, in whatever way you want, but the artist who sent it in, um, she, she, she said that it was representing the blood of climate change, of sea level rise. So all the issues, all the people that are going to die, all the habitats that are going to be lost, um, the migration that's going to happen. So quite an abstract one, but um, quite powerful. And then this one, again, is a different take on it. It's more of a humorous take. Um, humorous, but humour has, a, there's a lot of poignancy to humour. So on the bottom, it says, Marco, the last bear, gets out of bed late. And we've got Marco there at the top saying, OK, guys, you can come out now. And he's standing on top of uh, an island and he's about to discover that he is the last bear left on Earth, which I think is it, it's a poignant response. Um, um, you know, we have to get into the mind of this bear um, and imagine what that feels like um, to be the last one of a species left on Earth. And I really love the way people, every, each one is unique. People are putting their perspective on climate change through the arts. So my second point is that um, the arts can help to create a shared sense of identity. The community arts is open to everyone. Um, it draws people in, people that wouldn't normally, you know, might not ordinarily even think about climate change. People who maybe don't have the confidence to talk about it, don't have the vocabulary to talk about it. Um, people who might feel uncomfortable if they don't know all the facts. People who feel like they might be um, shown up for not knowing everything. But it's a huge subject. We obviously don't know everything. And the arts can help to draw people in in a different way um, than, than the facts. So, our first arts project was probably in 2006. We had um, just lost our public inquiry. Uh, so we, we, we started in 1998 with a view to develop a community wind farm. The idea being that it's a, we, we, we harness the wind and we sell the electricity and then that money goes back into community regeneration. So that's like, I think a lot of community energy groups. <coughs> We worked for eight years to try and get it through planning. We got turned down of planning, we appealed, um, went to public inquiry, and then in, two, in 2006, we lost public inquiry. So it was an uh, absolutely disappointing, gutting result. And it was up until then, we had assumed through our, our community engagement that you give people the facts, you explain and share the severity of climate change, and people will 
want to do something about it instinctively. Um, but I think we all know that it doesn't work like that, it doesn't happen like that. And um, it was when we lost the public inquiry that I think was a turning point and we realised we've got to do something different. It's being objective doesn't work, being purely objective doesn't work. Um, and because the system isn't objective, the, we were turned down on the basis, even though we'd done an independent referendum um, in which the majority of people in the area said, yes, let's go for a wind farm, we were turned down on the basis that um, the visual impact is too great. So, um, so we kind of felt, you know, this isn't working, <laughs> we've got to do something different. So that's when we decided to do our naked calendar <laughs> in, 20, in 2006. Um, there, there, there are some people here that are in the calendar, but I'm not going to share those pictures with you. Um, uh, yeah, we wanted to do something different, we wanted to make, make a statement. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was, it was great fun um, doing the calendar. Um, it was a bonding experience. Um, it helped us raise some money towards our judicial review, which we also lost, by the way. <laughs> Um, the wind farm is up, by the way. It took 19 years to get it up. Yeah, 2017, we finally got the wind farm up. But um, so in 2006, this is this was our first starting point. But one of the most important things about the calendar was that it helped us to regroup and reconnect with all the people that have been involved in the project for the last eight years or been supporting the project for eight years. Because there's very little that supporters can actually do in a community energy project. When you're busy writing funding applications, writing planning applications, doing EIAs, doing bird surveys, bat surveys, slug surveys, every survey under the sun, there's not a lot that community can actually do to support other than you know, standing outside the planning office saying, yes, let's go for the swim park. So actually what we found was the calendar kind of, it was something that we could all do, do together. And it was a creative, you know, create, we were creating something. We hadn't created a wind farm yet, but we were creating a calendar. And we flogged them. <laughs> we flogged them at the, um, the, the climate march in, in, the, in London. Um, so, um, yeah, so that was one of the pictures. This is always my favourite one. <laughs> um, and even the scaffolding guys the, of the solar company wants to be in it as well. <laughs> Um, they weren't actually wearing any pants under there. <laughs> um, okay, I'll leave that up for a moment. Yeah, so we went on to do lots and lots of um, climate change arts, project, sorry, community arts projects around climate change. Um, uh, so animation, film, poetry, theatre, printmaking, lots and lots of different projects. Uh, this uh, this is Gillian Clark, who was the National Poet of Wales at the time, uh, doing a workshop with the Leithport Talbot Young Writers Squad, uh, writing on, on climate change. She also judged one of our poetry competitions, as did Caroline Duffy, who was the Poet Laureate at the time, and we produced some poetry anthologies on climate change. Um, this is a group of scriptwriters who um, created a play in a weekend on food security in the light of climate change. So it's called Nine Meals to Anarchy, and it was set in a Tesco supermarket. Um, uh, but we also did several collaborative plays. So we did one on called Flood, which was um, set in an evacuation centre just outside Swansea. It was the night of the Swansea was completely flooded, obviously in our minds, um, and it was set in the, the evacuation centre. We did one on the last albatross and the, the tourist potential of the, the final albatross. Um, we did another one called um, We're Oil in This Together, <laughs> which was a collection of plays based on a series of, of, of massive prints, um, an exhibition called Conscious Oil by this amazing printmaker called Emily Johns. So these, these prints are absolutely huge. And each one was the... Each play was a response to one of those um, prints. Um, so a, a choir, which where they selected songs that were relevant to the climate emergency and rehearsed them obviously and, and performed them. So lots of if we were approaching it from lots of different angles and lots of different participants doing different techniques. So um, each art form attracted a different kind of person. Um, 
So loads and loads of people were involved. Um, and what we discovered was that the groups were a safe space for people to talk about climate change, to express their emotions, how they felt about what's happening to the world, um, ask questions, admit to not knowing about climate change. So, so you know, quite a lot of people didn't really know anything about it before, before they got involved. Um, to debate the responses of the government and us and individuals, and, and generally to, to build a vocabulary to talk about it. Because I think that's one of the problems is that the more we don't talk about it, the less we're able to talk about it. So all of these workshops were geared then towards creating a piece of art. Um, and that detaches it a little bit from it being all in the head because you're, you're there, you're working together to create something. And, and the person creating something is a really bonding experience anyway. Um, you're, you're sharing a bit of yourself and you're witnessing other people's emotions and thoughts about the subject. So a big part of art, of the arts, is about play, um, playing with ideas, playing with materials, imagining, imagining, uh, improvising, experimenting. Um, and um, play is a really important part I think, of, of generating solutions. Unexpected things happen when we play. We don't know, you know, as long as we allow ourselves just to, um, you know, for, for there not to be any boundaries to, to what we, you know, can say um, and do, play really allows us to, to come up with, with new things. Um, and, and new ideas, new ways of seeing, new perspectives on the world. And that's my third point, is that the arts facilitate a new way of seeing. So during the Apollo mission in 1969, the astronauts said that the most powerful experience wasn't landing on the moon, but was seeing the Earth from a distance, and uh, seeing it as a whole planet. Um, it was the only colour in the universe, one of them said. And seeing it and it's as a whole and its fragile atmosphere, um, they said was like one of the most awe-inspiring feeling, it gave the most awe-inspiring feeling of oneness and togetherness of, of being on this planet. Um, and that, that photo is credited with triggering the environmental movement, which is pretty good for one photo. <laughs> Um, it just shows what art can actually do. So in 2019, which was 50 years from the 50-year um, anniversary of the moon landing and from the start of the environmental movement, we decided to use that concept and do a community arts project um, and a sustainable moon landing. So we, um, we had about 150 people to help us build a, our lunar module, um, it's a sustainable capsule made of willow, local willow and papier-mâché from recycled newspapers. And um, we painted it and uh, we had about 10 groups creating control panels for inside the capsule. And we had the Tower Guild of Spinners, Weavers and Dyers to make the felt to line the capsule. And then we built a lunar scape in the art center, blacked it all out. So we had craters across the floor. And then we live stream projected onto the wall behind it, um, footage from the International Space Station. So you could basically look through the window of the capsule and you would just see the Earth slowly rotating um, in real time. Which was actually, I know it wasn't on the moon, but it was quite awe inspiring. I, I lived there for two weeks and every minute you're just watching the earth going on. So we had about 800 visitors um, who got involved and you know, stood inside the capsule. And, and, and we talked about what does that do to you when you see this fragile earth? You, you know what we're doing to the environment. We, you know what we're doing to the atmosphere. What does that do for you when you're watching that from a distance? So we had loads of conversations with, you know, all ages from these little tots right up to, you know, people in their 90s about climate change. Um, 
And that was a really fun project. So my final point um, is that the arts can be a stepping stone to action. The process of creating something does change us inside. Sometimes through creating something, we find a way through a problem. We find a, um, we find a role for ourselves. Um, it can be quite challenging. You know, we might be challenging our perspective on things. We might be challenging our behavior or our assumptions or even our ethics. Um, but it does, it, it, it does, it can help us to find where we need to be in, in this, you know, crazy world of, of climate change. For many people and participants in the project, it was the first time that they'd ever really thought or talked about climate change. So it's impossible to measure the impact of the arts on climate change. And um, I mean, we've, we've been doing arts projects for about 12 years, and it's, you know, we can't say for definite that it's had an effect on our work. Um, but it has helped us to engage people and to keep people engaged in our work. Um, so yes, we've got the wind farm up. Yes, we've got a big solar project right across South Wales. Um, and we use the arts in a lot of our community engagement. Um, and if we wanted to put a measurable impact, a measurable measurement on the arts, we feel that it has had an impact on people investing in our share of our co-ops. So with our co-op, we raised three million pounds of community shares. And with EGNI, which is our solar co-op, we've raised five million pounds. So yeah, it's not all down to the arts, obviously, but I think it has helped. So our project at the moment is, um, is we're building a we'll be, we're building a zero carbon arts and education centre because we're absolutely convinced that the arts has a big role to play in community energy. Um, so uh, we're in the process of doing it at the moment. We bought the old the former primary school in the village, um, and we're currently repurposing it. So we've got solar ninety kilowatts of solar on the roof. We've got a fifty kilowatt ground source heat pump. So obviously we're looking for, for more places to get renewable energy from, but we're aiming for zero carbon by 2030. It's due to open in January. Um, we've got uh, artist studios in there, education facilities, uh, community cafe, we've got charge points, four charge points for electric cars. We've got, um, gonna have, well, hopefully community gardens, but it's gonna be a hub for the community. And, and what I particularly like about it is that it's, it's a demonstration, it's, a, it's an example of how community energy can feed back into community arts, because it's only through the profits from, of the wind farm, the community wind farm, that we've been able to buy the building in the first place and draw in match funding to repurpose it, which is 1.6 million pounds it's cost to, to renovate it. And the, the Profits from the wind farm are underpinning the, our business model for actually keeping it going. Um, it's, it's in quite a poor area, so we wanted to make it sure it's affordable for local people to use. So it's been really important for us that we've got the wind farm that will underpin that financial model. So, um, so it's a really nice symbiosis of community arts and community energy. And just one last one. Please come and visit when we're open. We're in Clifton Gorse and um, we should be open in the new year. Thank you for listening. I wasn't living in your new capsule for six weeks. It was brilliant. Yeah. It was. Um, <laughs> <You're> good man. <laughs> well, no, it was. Um, we spent two weeks building it. So that's when we had loads of people coming in and, and helping to create it. And then it was weird being in the art centre at night time and then being woken up in the morning by the art staff coming up and bringing me up a cup of tea. Um, but um, yeah, it, it was because it, it, I tried to stay in the bit that was blacked out. Obviously, we had workshops in the other bit. Um, and everyone that came in, we invited them to create a piece of art. Um, so we had these sort of little craters and from each crater people created something 
and we, we did an exhibition called Message to the Universe, and it was about that whole idea. You, you're looking at the Earth. If you wanted to tell the rest of the universe what is on planet Earth, what would you tell them? So everyone created something to tell the universe about planet Earth. And it was just a nice way of um, involving, you know, once people have looked at that image of the Earth, what would you want to, what do you want to celebrate about planet Earth? So yeah, it was quite, it was quite awe-inspiring being there. So. As part of the hub project and the renovation, are you, are you gonna be um, visualizing the energy side of the building in any way? like through a dashboard or some kind of art project that relates to energy generation? Uh, well, we, we're, we're going to have the, the displays mm. um, when you come in. There'll be kind of interactive displays showing the generation of the turbines because they're just up behind yeah. the thing, but also the solar and maybe ground source, depending on technology. Um, but we're, our plan is to do a... Um, artist residency scheme so on climate change or renewable energy and they'll have access to the turbines and the solar and everything so um so quite like to leave that up to artists to to present it or to you know in whatever way yeah. they they can so we're, we'll be inviting artists on a regular basis possibly newly graduate artists as well to have a studio for maybe six months to kind of help them get set up but with a view to really thinking about climate change, um, not just any artist residency, but, but to kind of focus on that side of things. Yeah, I mean, the reason I ask for that in particular is that Swansea University put in a, a special interest fund with FQ to do a, an art project representing net zero carbon on the campus. Oh, it's right. a similar idea of what you're saying there, but in terms of the visualisation of what net zero looks like. Yeah. Co 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 um, crossover quite well with a project like that in terms of the campus versus you know out in the community um, yeah it's that with the innovate it? it's uh hefq so it's right. um the funding council for wales higher education funding council yeah. okay right. um they have put out some net zero funding across all the different universities yeah um, and we've got this one project in particular looking at art we're working with them uh kind of connect uh arts department to do some artistic impression okay that. So interesting oh yeah that would be really good yeah because i've just been doing some work with swansea university scientists who uh we did this thing called climate lab um which was absolutely fascinating because they wanted three artists to come uh within within sort of scientific community to talk about their emotions about climate change because scientists are obviously dealing with facts of figures all the time and so many of them were saying we're not allowed to show what we feel about what we're reading or hearing or all our research so i was expecting um a conference where we found out all the different sort of results that they were coming up with and the kind of research that they were doing um and then reinterpreting that in a in an art art form but it was all about emotion and it was so it was really poignant it was you know realizing sort of realizing that actually the scientists are kind of holding this all inside and then it all came out at this conference um so yeah i'd be really interested to, to hear more about that thanks um done yeah out of all the things you presented a huge number of different art projects there which were the most engaging for people that don't usually engage with climate change and which people don't usually in, get engaged with the art as well. It was a, a, it's an a out and out kind of one which felt really got through or a number. I think it's really difficult to say because people, um, different people got involved in the different things. And it, a lot of it came down to, I think, how much time they really had in developing the piece of work. So I think the, the script writing was really good because we'd be together perhaps, I mean, you know, get um, professional artists in, to, like a director in to come and direct the, the play. And it, a lot depends on who it was as the director of the, 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 the workshop. So we tried to get people that were, you know, on the same wavelength and, and were really committed to climate change. I think the ones that didn't work quite so well were perhaps ones that where the artist was leading it wasn't really quite sure about which way they were going. Um, the theatre project were really good um, and we always picked like it, it wasn't climate change generally it was like a specific topic 
um, and go into that in quite a lot of detail. Uh, what I would say is I think that the people that are involved in the creating got more out of it in terms of climate change than uh, people that were watching it, observers, uh, because you're immersed in it then, aren't you? You're, coming, you're having to really work out what you feel and what you think before you can create something. Um, so every person that has been involved in the project had gone through that process. Um, but I, uh, it, it's really difficult to know uh, which, I would, which one worked, which art form worked best, because there's so many different variables on that. Um, I think you just, I think it's just going with what, what, with who you can find to, to run it. With the, we, we work in schools a lot. Um, we've got this education officer who set up a, a project called We Are Energy Warriors. And she goes into schools in Pembrokeshire and wherever we've got solar panels on schools, she'll go into the schools and do some work with them. And she's, um, she's got some fantastic artists to go into schools and work with the pupils. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's a graffiti artist that's ma been making brilliant kind of energy warriors with like, pictures of energy warriors, massive, really bright, really colourful. And I think what the pupils really like, and they're learning about climate change and renewable energy and stuff, but the art helps them to process that and to kind of reinterpret it in their own way. So it's, it's a sort of gelling as well. As it's not just the fun and the play, it's actually kind of like reprocessing the, the information too. But I'm not answering your question really. But... <laughs> <coughs> Great, um, any final questions for Emily? Oh, thank you very much, Emily. Thank you. That was uh, a yeah, fascinating presentation. And, um, yeah, really, really interesting to, to hear about well, when community groups have that sort of, you know, asset like a wind turbine or solar panels and can use the income for that, just what can be achieved um, and the sort of different creative directions that could be that can be taken in. Um, and just sort of on the topic of art as well, I think you'll see just on each of the tables, Regen's latest art project that we've been involved with, Heat Creatures, um, that some of the team did where we had an artist in residence and use it using art as a way to sort of um, to, to visualize different heating technologies and the decarbonization of heat through art. So we haven't got loads of those packs of cards, but if you can grab one, feel free to take it to take it away with you and sort of display that. If you've got a community space or any young people you're working with, especially, do feel free to, to grab that or speak to Prina if um, if you'd like any any more of those, definitely. Um, but now, anyway, we've come to our to our breakout sessions. So this is really the the chat, the time, the half an hour or so um, for you guys to to ask the questions you want to want to ask, have the conversations with our. Okay, thanks, thanks everyone. Um, so next on our agenda, I'm really delighted that we're joined by Paul Cowell, who's the technical manager at the Welsh Government's Energy Service. Um, and he's going to speak to us about their offering for community energy and how we can support communities across Wales um, in their projects. So, Paul. Good afternoon. It's a sort of strange thing being back in front of people in real life for change um, rather than in front of the Google Box. Um, yeah, it's really nice to be here. Um, really good to have the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I'm just, before I start, going to introduce also my colleague, um, Elliot, uh, Elliot Clark, who is a uh, um, technical advisor with the uh, Welsh Government Energy Service also. Um, he's an important man because he's, he's the man that, that sort of tends to manage most of the grant uh, distribution. Uh, so um, we'll come on to that in a moment. Um, but I, I just thought I'd put him in the spotlight early doors. So, um, so there's at least one word, one, one word in that uh, that uh, uh, title: word, Welsh Government Energy Service. That's, that's probably a little bit scary for um, community uh, organisations. It's, it's not Welsh. It's not energy. It's probably not service. Um, uh, but I think at times government is somewhat seen as as the uh, you know, maybe maybe ne not necessarily the energy, but certainly there's a hesitancy there, perhaps to uh, uh, to want to engage um, with um, with Welsh government. Um, but what I'd like to do is is show that we're actually a little bit more friendly than that. Um, and actually, in the in the room earlier today, were a couple of uh, Welsh government um, representatives. 
um, uh, they've left now, which is a, a shame, um, but it does mean I'm, I'm not getting marks on, on my uh, performance today. Um, but they, um, they're also very approachable. And, and what I'd like to demonstrate is that, that what we're, we're here for is to be um, much more of a, a companion to you um, than something to be, uh, be wary of. Um, we're here as, uh, as support um, uh, consultants, uh, um, uh, counsellors, even, even therapists at times. Um, so who are we? Uh, the Welsh Government Energy Service. Um, well, we're, we're actually a consortium of, of three organisations. Um, so it's, it's ourselves Energy Saving Trust, um, which uh, is responsible for uh, the communities, uh, community renewables part of the um, energy services um, delivery. Um, but uh, our, our lead partner is um, Carbon Trust, um, who are particularly responsible for um, public sector and local authority. Um, activity, um, particularly around energy efficiency, but also around renewable energy um, and um, uh, local partnerships, which uh, which tends to deal with more of the regional planning uh, activity. I should also add that um, the Energy Saving Trust and, and our boss, um, uh, and Elliot's also involved in this, in this stream as well, um, deals a lot with um, uh, fleet, um, greening of fleet. Um, in Wales, and um, that, that's become a, a really important part of the, the public sector activity um, for um, the energy service in, in recent months and years. Um, but uh, what I'm going to concentrate, obviously, is mostly what we can do for, for the community sector. And what we do is offer, as it says on the board, a technical, commercial and procurement advice and support to help turn projects into reality. Um, so that's the, sh the, the shorthand. Um, but, but actually what we do is, is provide, um, as, as I mentioned, um, technical advice, people time, um, skills, knowledge, um, and also money, um, which, is, which is in many cases um, quite, quite a, a, a help. Um, we ourselves are funded on a five-year stream, a five-year cycle, um, which is coming to an end in, in April next year. So we'll be, um, uh, sorry, end of March next year, actually. Um, so we will be um, rebidding for uh, our our role um, uh, very shortly, we, we imagine. Um, but yeah, this is a five-year program, and we're funded year to year. So our, our budget uh, runs from um, uh, April first to end of March, um, and it's it, as you can imagine uh, with, with many uh, many government um, uh, funding streams, it's, it's on a use it or, or lose it basis. So effectively, if we haven't spent it, it tends to go. Um, back into, into the, the general coffers, uh, not for our, our own personal use. Um, so I, mi I missed just, just from that slide there. If you want to see a little bit more about what we have done over the years, um, the, the three annual reports for the first three years of service uh, are already available, and the one for um, the most recent year, year, last year, should be available in about um, a couple of weeks' time, we anticipate. So um, just to put this all in context, um, and probably the main, um, the main um, uh, legislation underpinning the work that we do, um, and also which is being reflected in the work that you do, um, is, is the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Um, so this is this is something which uh, uh, I think we should rightly be proud of as, as uh, having established in the legislature in Wales, um, and it is a, a, absolutely something which is seen um, uh, very importantly by um, Welsh government itself. We're, we're definitely seeing that uh, in the, the applications um, for capital grants that we've supported recently, um, demonstration of of, if you like, compliance with the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act is, is a really important feature. Um, and that's, that's interesting because it, it doesn't just focus on the energy element. So, so going back to, to, to what Emily was saying earlier, you know, it also looks at, looks at aspects such as um, you know, how it's supporting you know, community cohesion, community resilience, um, you know, cultural, you know, Welsh language, um, you know, uh, participation and it is doing that indeed through the energy sparks and funding that was uh, uh, awarded 
um, to um, to, uh, to the uh, via EGNI to support um, education uh, in schools on, on energy issues. Um, so that is certainly being seen as as a as a key driver for um, for the work that um, uh, the work that community energy is, um, sector is doing, uh, and also a key basis for for evaluating whether or not projects should, should be supported. So I think if you can nail um, the well-being of future generations um, act and how you contribute to that, um, that that's certainly a, a, a key factor in in being able to. Um, access um, support from Welsh government. Um, in terms of the, the, I suppose the shorter term ambition, um, this is this is the programme for for the, the current uh, a few years. So so um, uh, obviously you'll be well aware that by 2030 we're looking to, to generate 70% of the electricity uh, uh, um, used in Wales uh, in Wales, uh, and for one gigawatt of uh, electricity to be locally owned. Uh, there's an interesting one there. Uh, that all new developments since 2020 have had to have an element of local ownership. I don't know whether that's widely known, but that is something that, that there, there is certainly opportunity around for the community energy sector um, to be able to participate in um, shared ownership, local ownership, um, to be able to support the development of, of projects and, and really um, sort of capture some local community value for, um, uh, for well, from the development of energy projects. Um, uh, I think the final one there, uh, very short term, uh, in the next uh, three, four years, is, is to expand the uh, public bodies and community enterprise um, renewable energy generation um, capacity uh, by an additional 100 megawatts, 100 megawatts and that's, that's for the, from the current programme for government. Um, so these are the technologies that we that we principally support. I wouldn't say these are the only ones that we support. So, uh, and, I, and I'd say if, if you've got a different technology that you think we ought to support, then try us. Um, because, for example, Transition Pro Wine in the past, I think, have had some um, uh, uh, some uh, exploration of, of um, uh, tidal stream energy, um, and that's certainly something that, that you know, in, in the right right circumstances, we would uh, we, we would certainly look at. Um, uh, but principally at the moment it's it's uh, wind power, uh, typically uh, single wind turbines or small clusters, um, solar and that's uh, PV or thermal, um, principally PV I have to say, um, but it can be roof mounted or um, uh, yeah, ground, ground mounted arrays. Uh, what I would caveat to, to, to both of those, and in fact all of this in general, is, is that there's something of a scale element to, to, to what Welsh Government um, is looking for in terms of projects they can support. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say you know, typically we're looking in the, in the 100 kilowatt plus range for, for projects, but that's not necessarily exclusive. What, what it does tend to mean is that, that unfortunately single um, building projects we're not able to support directly. Um, but for example, uh, again, EGNI, I think have done a, uh, you know, a, a fantastic approach by, by amalgamating, um, creating a portfolio of, of projects and generating scale through um, uh, you know, volume of installations really. Um, and new areas that we're developing, which sort of ties in with what um, Western Power is, is, is also looking to, 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 to build understanding around um, and, and seek, you know, seek ways, ways of communities to, to engage with is uh, around the, the energy storage elements and um, heat pump opportunities. So decarbonisation of heat is not something that we've had a lot of uh, involvement in to date, but it's certainly something that I'm sure you know, as, as a community energy sector, we will have a massive involvement with in future. Um, uh, so, who can access these services? Well, most of you already know because you, most of you already have them here. Um, but I think it's, it, it, I mean, it's great if you if, if if you're able to spread the word. If you know of organisations that might be looking for funding, um, you know, we we can support all all manner of, of community and social enterprises. Um, so. Um, uh, that ranges from you know, community councils uh, through to um, you know, BENCONs, uh, other CIOs, um, and you know, various other you know, established um, community uh, um, structures. Um, again, it's, uh, I think if, if you think you are operating in a, a social enterprise manner, um, 
try us because uh, we are the, 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 the final arbiters of whether or not uh, you're eligible for support. Um, and, and as mentioned, what we can assist with is, is um, uh, development manager time. Uh, so we, we have a number of development managers um, dotted around Wales. Uh, so from, from uh, um, Northwest Wales, uh, down the, the, the West Coast. Um, uh, uh, so two, two on the West Coast, uh, two in uh, the Southwest region, and then uh, two or three in um, uh, the sort of South, South and South Central area. Um, we don't currently have anybody in directly in the Northeast, um, but that's not to say we don't support projects in the Northeast. Um, we would absolutely <laughs> um, be, be happy to, to engage with any uh, community um, community organisation anywhere around the country. And, and our development managers are not necessarily geographically focused, they're, they're more skills focused and, and where we have capacity and resource to, to support people. Um, and what we're able to do is to technical financial modelling services. Um, scoping and feasibility studies, so really to early, early stage project development and um, getting you to the point where you can then um, you know, get to, towards um, financial close. If we can't support directly, what we can do is provide access to um, development, um, development grants uh, and development loans. Um, and we've got a couple of new, the new features that are coming through from this year, which might be of, of interest, particularly to more established groups. So you may have projects um, that you're looking to take forward, but perhaps struggling for capacity, struggling for resources, and so forth. Um, I won't dwell too much on the challenges and opportunities, so I'm sure most of you are well aware of that, but um, that um, uh, and I think Faithful touched upon you know, many of the changing energy market issues that, that, we're, that we're facing at this moment in time. Um, but a couple that, that yeah, I, I mentioned, you know, shared ownership is one that, that is creating a you know, potentially new opportunities for uh, community energy operators. Um, uh, but, but obviously the things that we're battling with as a community energy sector is how to make projects work. Uh, how do we maximize your revenue as a, as a community energy generator? Um, yeah, how do we, how do we you know, guarantee that, that people in our communities can, can you know, afford, afford to buy energy? Um, how do we create stability for consumers so there's not those massive peaks and troughs as you know, stuff goes off in uh, Ukraine or elsewhere around the world? Um, how do we insulate ourselves from, from that? So, so there are a range of, of you know, potential opportunities, I think, that we're, uh, we're, we're, we're coming to, to, to realise. Um, uh, and obviously there are, there are, there are a number of, of solutions to that. So you know, making more use of behind the meter, private wire, um, sleeving arrangements, um, and looking at um, you know, storage as well as, as you know, potential new opportunities. Um, as I say, generally we're looking for projects at somewhat larger scale, but, but again, do talk to us. Um, we, we, we're certainly happy to consider um, you know, possibilities, but, but yeah, it, uh, ideally we're looking, we're looking for some, some degree of scale to projects that we will, we'll, we'll support. But as I mentioned, community aggregation is a is certainly a potential candidate for, um, for support. Um, just in outline, the, these are the, the, the services that development managers can typically support with. So um, yeah, from an initial, initial you know, uh, high level uh, scoping review, um, and if, if we can't support, so I'm personally to other sources of support where that might be appropriate. Um, we can do high level site assessments, so looking at whether your site is appropriate for what you're, what you're intending to do, um, the, the, the first stage grid investigations, uh, help to, to um, initiate your, your um, planning submission, not necessarily to, to, to do the planning um, submission itself, but certainly to, to support you in that process. Um, and also working with you to, to see if there are ways that we can, we can sort of raise, raise you know, ambition potential. Um, and a key one, I suppose, is looking at, at when projects are not going to work and, and being realistic about that and saying, you know, perhaps we're looking to be in the wrong place here. You know, maybe something else is, 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 is going to be more appropriate in this case. Um, on the technical and financial side, again, uh, a varying range. Initial solar layout design, for example. Um, uh, GIS mapping. So, for example, if you're looking at, uh, at uh, you know, um, location planning, 
Um, you know, are there any uh, any service offers, as I mentioned, you know, um, constraints such as um, you know, uh, uh, best and most valuable land? Um, uh, we can look at where you know, potential off takers you know, might be located close to you. So those private wire connections could potentially come into play. And we can look at aspects such as, as you know, better maximization of the value of on-site generation, you know, for example, through consumption profiling and uh, curtailment assessments. Um, most importantly, um, well, not necessarily most importantly, um, but we will support you in that in that um, final business case support. So, so working with you um, to develop, a, 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 if you like, a bankable application for for, for um, a, a loan and or grant and support. So onto onto the money side of things. Um, so this is where we um, where we're able to support. Um, you're probably aware that. Um, uh, the energy service um, works quite closely with the um, Development Bank of Wales. We're obviously completely independent from them, and I should add as well, we're, we're also completely, we, we, we're not, as, as, as I mentioned, you know, uh, directly ourselves and Welsh Government, so we, we, we straddle somewhere between, you know, between the bank, um, uh, the Welsh Government, and um, uh, the Community organisations, um, but really we're you know, we're partnering with community groups to implement the wishes of Welsh government and satisfy the needs of <laughs> of the financiers. Um, uh, so um, yes, if if you're looking for support, for example, for legal um, specialist work, um, you know, grid applications, um, structuring land lease options, um, other legal agreements uh, for between. You know, PPAs with potential off takers and so forth, um, or specialist planning um, uh, studies. That, that's the type of thing that, that's appropriate for um, development grant support. Um, and we have a budget typically annually there of, of around about £150,000. Now, this, this year is a little bit unusual in, in that we've got a, a, a slightly enhanced pot which covers a couple of new elements as well, and we don't quite know yet what the split's going to be. Um, but typically, we will support um, development grants in the in the range of, uh, well, let's say five to, to yeah, I mean, Elliot, you're the man, um, yeah, five to maybe thirty thousand, typically. Yeah. Yeah. So each will be assessed on the case by case basis with the development manager um, uh, to to you know, understand whether or not it's something something that we can support, and then it will get final final sign off and approval. Um, uh, via Elliot and, and Jim, our boss. Um, so yeah, if you if you if you have a project that you, you know, you, you're needing to take forward, um, you need some support with small amounts of, of uh, cash to do that. The development grant route is there. If it's a larger requirement you're looking for, then we're probably looking more for a, a, a bank loan and justification of that through through um, uh, the development bank. Um, but that again is something that we can support you in preparing applications for that. Uh, then the two, uh, I suppose, the two most significant capital elements. Sorry, Kai, I'm probably way over time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah it's uh, capital loans and capital grants. So, one thing to note: um, we do have capital grant funding available, and uh, this this year we have three million pounds of capital grant funding available for community renew renewable energy projects. Unfortunately, most of that's already earmarked. Um, that said, do do come to us if you think you've got a project, because if we're aware of projects coming forward, then we've got more of a case to, um, to discuss with, um, with, with Welsh Government uh, about you know, potential future capital resource funding. Um, but that has certainly been beneficial, and that has, has, has been really driven by, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, how de projects demonstrating how they, they, they um, you know, are meeting the wellbeing of future generations in particular. And that's been a key requirement of the Welsh government for that for that capital capital grant funding. Um, and capital loans of between fifty and and uh, two million uh, fifty thousand to two million pounds available through uh, the uh, development bank, um, and that's something that we again can support you in in accessing. So we'll help you um, develop a, uh, an appropriate sanction paper, looking at the you know, your organisational structure, you know, your finances. Um, revenue streams, the, the financial model, risks, um, uh, and uh, you know, really sort of you know, trying to present the case that, that, 
the, the bank feels is, is um, uh, supportable. Um, just onto the last two, very quickly. This one, new for, new for this year, resource grants. So we have a bit of cash available this year from that enhanced um, grant pot. So if you're, if you're looking to develop a project, you don't um, quite have the in-house in in capacity um, to, to support you to do that. So if, if you need more people time yourselves, um, we do for, uh, have um, funding available to, to you know, potentially fund uh, an individual, you know, either full or part-time um, for, for a year. Um, uh, we haven't released the expression of interest yet for that. That'll be out very shortly. But um, if you want to leave your, your details, um, then we can certainly um, uh, circulate more information to you about that. Uh, and also, we will, uh, somewhat later this year, have um, some additional um, specific uh, legal and financial support available to uh, for community groups that are looking to, to yeah, build partnerships with um, commercial project developers. So, so if there's a commercial project um, in your area, um, you, you, you think you know, that there's an opportunity for you to take a, a part, part share in that, um, that project, or if you've been offered a part share in that project, this is to help you understand that what you're getting is a, you know, a, a, a reasonable offer. Um, and it, it will be external support. It won't be from the energy service directly, but it will be to fund um, specialist legal and technical support for that. Uh, that's probably about way more than my time, but um, uh, if you want to get hold of any more from us, um, there are the, the sources of information. Um, look forward to working with you all. Thanks very much. Great, thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Paul. Um, in the interest of time, I will ask anyone who's got questions for Paul. I'm sure there are a few uh, just to grab him at the end. I hope you don't mind that. Um, but yeah, really, really interesting for, to hear about the, the range of really useful capacity building support that is available uh, through the Welsh Government Energy Service for community energy groups. Um, but I will move on to our last, but no, by no means least presentation of the day. Um, and it's from Mark Mears from Western Power Distribution, who's going to talk about the network capacity in South Wales, future plans, and a bit of a snapshot into the green recovery project. Thank you very much, Doug. Definitely at least. <laughs> so I'm quickly going to talk about um, some of the plans of Western Power I've got, and specifically for me is Green Recovery, um, which I'll explain more is about later on. So as you can see from a couple of graphs, um, it's a lot of information to take in. So it's just showing the predicted growth up to 2050. So we are looking at how we're going to look at the network in the very near future, but also looking so far into the future which is very unpredictable at the moment. So you can see here, uh, Rio ED1 is our first business plan and it's due to end uh, March, 2023, so March of next year, of which then our Rio ED2 business plan will come into force for the further five years. Um, it hasn't been confirmed yet, but due to have a, a judgment from Ofgem in, in June, um, which then will be finalized in September and we'll know for definite where we're investing, how we're investing. But you can see in ED2, the prediction from 2020 to 2028, uh, just from the car charges alone, uh, we've got about 120,000 predicted in 2020. Um, in 2028, we're predicting over 2 million electric vehicle charges. So you can imagine the infrastructure required for that. Um, also heat pumps, so 60,000 is a growing technology, um, trying to decarbonize. So we're predicting another 893,000 um, businesses, homes with heat pumps being connected. So we, we, we're already predicting it. We're just trying to build the network and look at innovative ways to then accept these connections. So every year we do an annual process, uh, which is called DFES, which is the distribution of future energy scenarios. So what we do is we talk to we engage with the stakeholders, find out what you guys want to do, who wants to connect, so local authorities, um, what the plans are. And we try and collate all of that information, which then comes up for a strategy for us to try and achieve. So that's something that we do, and it's available on our website. So you can look at all of our previous strategies, along with strategy for, don't think this year is out yet. 
but it will be soon. So we've got, like I said, plenty of publications. So uh, DFES can be found uh, on all the stakeholder reports. So every stakeholder engagement that we have is all recorded um, to, to show us where we can learn, what we can do, what the future is, what plans are for the local authorities, how much work is going to be put into it, and then we can predict uh, the growth for that. In Rio ED2, we've got something that's never been put into a business plan before, which is uh, what we call the uncertainty mechanism. So we don't really know, we can't look into the future to see how much is going to be connected. So therefore, we can't really ask off Gem and say, right, this is our business plan, this is how much money we want, because it could be higher or lower than the figure we want. So at the moment, WPD's best view is um, the purple box, but we have got an uncertainty mechanism, which is basically double what we're predicting. Um, so if growth of EVs, if growth of network demand, if growth of heat pumps really take off in such a big way that we need to need to invest even more money, then we've got the mechanism within ED2 to sort of say we need more money. So on the green recovery, which is more of my subject, um, so Western Power have made a commitment to try and recover from the pandemic as quickly as we possibly can. So they've committed 60 million pounds over the next two years. Um, so the, invest, the investment is to try and unlock as many green developments as we possibly can. So that's connection of heat pumps, fuel chargers, solar, wind, whatever it might be. So we've identified interest uh, in the low carbon technology projects. So it's gone by previous applications. We've also had a call for evidence, which we'll see later on. Um, that was started in February and March. Uh, we received 200 responses from that. Um, which had previous connections that were no, not, not able to connect, but also new connections, which was really good. Um, and it's to unlock the additional capacity. So where we have to do some substantial reinforcement, which wasn't able to be funded by the customer, we've been able to fund it and to try and get customers connected. So it is to release capacity in, in all areas. And you can see this uh, there's a map there showing some of our projects across all of WPD license areas. So we made our investment decisions based on three main criteria. So it was the deliverability of the, of the, of the project. It was the utilization of the project and whether it was value for money. So pretty much the same way as the Bosch government are doing the justification. It's we will look at whether it's a very good project, maybe not so good. And then we will put some money into it if we need to. So the schemes that we're doing, it's from really, really small schemes to some multi-million pound schemes that will unlock a lot of capacity in certain areas. So there's a little summary. So it's 60 million pounds, 73 projects, but that is across all of WPD, um, predicting a lot of connections and a lot of capacity. So we've looked, like I said, value for money is how much money can we invest but unlock a massive amount of generation or load. So a little bit more specific for South Wales, um, we've got small schemes. So these are what we call the small schemes, but they, they to unlock in vital areas. So as you can see, there's some, some mid Wales schemes there. So it's out in the rural areas where we haven't necessarily got some massive capacity available. So we're doing some schemes there to unlock some capacity. And, and as you can see in, in some very vulnerable areas, so service stations, for example, with the uplift in EV charges, there's a lot of connections required. So we're trying to invest in the areas that we believe it, it would be beneficial. Then we've got some really big schemes. So uh, Neuros is a, is a primary substation up towards uh, Monmouth area, uh, Chepstow area, and it's to install another substation. So basically we've had applications from smaller people, so the smaller houses, um, where we haven't necessarily been able to connect due to capacity. So now Green Recovery have said, we'll put a second transformer in, which will unlock a load of capacity in that area. And it also supports other primary substations as well. So the wider network is also benefiting from it. 
We've also done a lot of uh, 33 kV circuit reinforcement, so the really high voltage stuff. Um, it's upgraded in the network, and what it'll do is enable it to operate with a different temperature. So we survey the lines and we make sure that if it operates at 75 degrees, for example, the line will sag, but it's still safe. So what we'll do is reconductor it, or we'll make it higher, or we'll do some work to it. And what that enables us to do is add more load, which then the temperature will grow, but then the line will be safe. So we've been doing that. That's a lot of that work has been done in Cardiff and West Wales. So hopefully the 33 kV ring in West Wales as well is a lot better. In Mega, uh, there's, a, there's an existing primary switchboard. It's quite old. It's got fault level issues, which is also a, a factor when it comes to generation. Um, it's one of the studies that we actually do. So we've decided we'll replace that switchboard. And then it also, because of the new technology in the switch rooms, it, the switches are smaller, therefore you can fit more in. So there's more customers able to be connected. We're also doing a similar thing in Talbot Green. So the smaller the switch is, we can replace the entire board, we'll get more connections on, and then it's more generator connections and load connections if required. So that is it from me. I thought I'd catch up to you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. And any questions, Mark, from any of that? It was very quick, but if you've got any questions, no problem. Uh, yeah, well, how do we get up the list to uh, have more capacity or not? How do we make the case in our area? Yeah, what, what I would say is if you get in touch with the local authority, make sure they've got it in the local authority plan. If not, get in contact with your local planner. Um, the more interest that you put in, the more it gets flagged up on our system as, as, a, as a place of interest. Um, but if you've got a specific application, Make an application through to us. We also hold connection surgeries. So if you request the connection surgery, it also then puts out sort of in, in the boss's mind, right, we've got interest in this local area. So we next time we'll try and target something. So what you're saying is if we had you know, lots of people wanting to generate you know, on our substation, we can get them all together and have a surgery with you because I mean, the way it seems to be a discussion in our group, the way it seems to happen is it's like it's, it just seems to be with one, you know, generator. So it's like, okay, you know, yeah, if you give us three million, we'll upgrade service, but there doesn't seem to be a coordination between lots of smaller generators to say, well, collectively we could, you know, just, you know invest in it. There seems to be a mechanism for that. Yeah, I, I, I believe you're right. At the moment, the mechanism would be for one quotation, which we'd have to reinforce the network for. So, yes, there's no collective offers of which then we can reinforce. But having the, inter having the interaction with the connection surgery and the local planners, at least then, if reinforcement does become available from WPD's point of view, so things like green recovery, and also the Rio ED2 plan and any reinforcement required afterwards, then that'll be factored into that if there's a massive interest in a certain area. So I would say have a connection surgery, put the question across, and also we've certainly got to look into our methods, but at the moment the license conditions dictate how we send customers quotations, but I'm sure it's something that we'll pick up and, and try and look into. So then that's those contact blockchain saying your licensing system Really fit the purpose to allow lots of small generators to join on. So yeah, we, we'd have to obviously we'd have to go through our policy team to see whether there is a mechanism to do it. At the moment, WPE hasn't got that mechanism to do it, but we will certainly have to have a look to see whether there is something within the license conditions that would allow us to do it. What, what I would say is I'll take the question away, I'll look into it to see whether our policy would allow a collective effort towards reinforcement. Is that right? There you go, Rob. Yeah, there's something that Mo touched on earlier, um, which uh, I if you could have on, which talked about alternative connection offers and what they actually are. So what would be an example of an alternative connection offer? 
I don't know if that, I know Facebook's not connected. Facebook, well done. Alternative connections, um, it depends your active network management. It's a very complicated subject. <laughs> You are given two choices. So the two choices are one, you'll be given what you call a non-firm connection, whereby on the basis of your application, you'll be told this is exactly how much you're going to connect. So that's it is 10 megawatts, 10 megawatts. But within the connection agreement, which will be sent out to you. There will also be a clause in there which will say you can also opt for an alternative connection, which is a curtailment connection. So, what that means is instead of you uh, accepting the 10 megawatts, you can probably say, okay, I don't mind being, or being cut off when conditions are unfavorable. So, it is you to make that decision to say, okay, I'm prepared, accept the terms of the year. To generate, say, at half the capacity. So, so an alternative connection is there are parts of the there are parts of the network where that is deployed. It's not everywhere. So, um, yeah. So, if you accept that, then you will offer that. Yeah, it's a it's based it's on percentage. Fact, it's actually a very cheap connection. So, a firm connection is something in the region of let's say five million. Pounds, but an alternative connection for the same thing will probably be 150,000. It, it's based on a percentage. Yeah. It uses a, a relay, which then it sends a signal, tells you to curtail by a percentage so that our network is able to cope with everything at the same time. Yeah. So, I guess from a community energy point of view, how would, how would they go about sort of modeling that? So, they you know, say, okay, well, um, we know that we'll save this much on the grid connection cost if we can curtail by 5% during these months. It would, it would be a business decision for the community energy group to, yeah. to make. I suppose, how would they know what the price of the, what, like, you know, how would they know if they could tell by 5%, they would say, you know, a million pounds on the connection. How would they sort of know that? We, we, if you ask for an alternative network connection, we would tell you the okay. curtailment. Yeah. And what we'd also do is we'd be able to provide you with history of when the possible curtailment would have happened in the past. So you might accept an alternative connection offer, which will tell you to curtail under a certain outage condition, um, which that outage condition may happen twice in one year. So you only curtail for twice in one year. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's knowing that asking for an alternative connection, yeah. and then you'll be able to, to connect cheaper yeah. um, with a, it's obviously a risk of curtailment. Great. Any other questions for Mark or for Faithful? Any yeah, any questions while we've while we've got WPD in the room that anyone has got? If you, I mean, we've got a, you know fixed export at um, you know, several hundred uh, kilowatts. Is there any opportunity, you know, if there's space on the grid to you know to, to have a you know like a flexible thing to go from a fixed one upwards to allow us to export more? It, there isn't a mechanism at the moment to allow you to export more unless you ask for more and it's studied. Um, you, yeah, the, the, the easiest thing to do is get in contact with us and ask for your maximum capacity that your, your generator is capable of. Um, and the only thing they can say then is, is no. And, and, then, and, then, and then it's kind of, it's kind of whether the local planner then has done, done the homework and, and you guys ask then, okay, so how much can we have? And if they say 780, then you say, okay, can I have 780, please? And the connection agreement would change, and then you've got that flexibility down, but you can't have flexibility out. I'm starting that in a different way. People today would come to the WPD and say they want to connect the five megawatts to so we will kind of start to say uh, you can't have five megawatts now, but that could be available say next year. So the point I'm making is what most people do is because they've been told you can't have five megawatts, they will probably say 
I'm not going to have everything at all. So the message I'm making is from April next year, the rules are changing, whereby what is applicable in terms of enforcement cost today might become lighter in terms of how the impact of you know, because you'll probably pay less or none at all. So the important thing I propose is not to be discouraged. It's better to put in a condition than not to put in one. I don't know if that makes sense. Change it. Things are changing from April or next day. Just, just to point out though, if you put in an application now, that it, you can't, the changes are from April to so yeah. put your application in April. It's current rules at the moment. Yeah. If you put an application in now, it'll be refused or it'll be reinforced with costs. Whereas April next year is doing the changes in May or enforced. Massive changes. <laughs> Huge. Yeah, Changes. everyone get your applications in next April. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to being a plan in next April. <laughs> Great. So, that, um, David? Yeah. Yeah, um, it's kind of stolen from somebody else on that table, but uh, in terms of capacity in your your RFI for like that, yeah, yeah, that thing, EG2. Into, into Opgem, sorry. Yeah. Um, That's fine. There's a lot of people sitting on high capacities. There's a lot of people that have got, you know, high ASC and things like that. but if you can be anywhere near it in, in the future, that those people sitting on that and, you, and not using that, it's going to become much more of a waste and more of a focus on that. Are you putting anything in that to off gem or off gem to the government about what well, you can have more control over that, more say in that, rather than the customer having complete control and just saying, well, we might need it one day, but then. Yeah, I, the answer to that is I don't know. I don't know if we're putting any mechanism in for the future. I know we have we are for new connections, so we're putting reservation of capacity rules within connection offers to kind of say, right, you've got a milestone to use this capacity by this date. If you don't, we'll take it back and and, and things like that. We are, I know that in, in my local area, um, because I was a Lem KV planner before Green Go, um, I was actively going to customers and saying, look, you're not using this capacity, I can save you money on your bills. And, and reduce the ASC. I suppose your question more is more towards generate a focus um, where they've got that capacity. And the answer is, I, I, I don't know. Do you know of any mechanism think, that they're thinking about? Yes. So as from April next year, uh, what's going to happen is, uh, say for example, you, you, are, you, you are granted 20 megawatts of capacity that's what we call it in an area. And then you say to the WP that, Actually, for the time being, I can only go into two megawatts. So, many we are looking at what we were ramping up period from two megawatts, maybe annually we'll be connecting two, four, like that, like that. So, we'll be looking at how that profile is going to work, whether indeed you are going to do it or not. So, if at some point it is determined that you are not doing that, then WPB will come to you and say, Can we have that thing? Because we can allocate it to them. Yeah, it's the existing connections that I don't know if we're looking into. At least I know from next year that's going to apply. Yeah. In fact, I was just looking at my phone now. It's going to work next week. Is that? Yeah. I'll be on that. There we go. Breaking news. Yeah, you can feedback on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Great. All right. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Mark. Thank you. Um, Great, so um, we have arrived at the end of our session. So thanks very much everyone for, for coming along and joining us today. It's been really great to, to be back doing in-person events and actually you know, getting, getting free lunch basically um, and networking with people in person. And um, you'll see that George has put a feedback form in front of everyone on your table. It'd be really good if you could just take a minute to fill that out for us because we do tailor these sessions um, sort of going forward based on what you what you all want to talk about what you want to hear from WPD sort of speakers you want us to invite what what topics you want us to cover um, so yeah please do take the time to to you know give us give us a rating out of 10 on how you found this session and what you'd like to see in future events particularly as well um, so that just leaves it to me really to, to thank our speakers so Emily Paul uh, Faithful and Mark as well as Jane for helping us out being our onshore wind expert in the breakout session um, thank the rest of the Regen team, so Prina, Ellie and George as well, um, and also Rob and Community Energy Wales for helping us out putting, to, putting together this, this event as well. Um, so I hope you've all found it really, really valuable coming along today. We've had 
quite a few sort of um, yeah a range of topics quite a few gear changes from sort of um yeah the, how community can can use sort of arts to engage people in climate action which is yeah really interesting what what emily was was covering it just shows the, the breadth of, of that sort of expertise the community energy can offer when they when they've got those those generation projects and what can be what can be done with that um, and then you know we see a really detailed information um, for communities on on network development and, and how you can work with WPD on your projects, as well as the information that Paul was was giving us on on how Welsh Government Energy Service can can support you as well. So do do take advantage of all the connections you've made today. I hope you've you've met you know the, the people that you came along wanting to and had had the conversations, got the answers that you were looking for as well. So so yeah, it's been been really enjoyable being being back in person. Um, and yeah, thank you all for coming. We will be sticking around as there's no need to, to leave in a hurry if you do want to just stick around and you know stay for drinks and network. I mean, I think we've got some fancy sparkling fruit juice as well. We can we can offer as well if anyone does does want to stick around for that. Um, so yeah, thanks.